then they are going to be deformed in space time if the mass is smooth, then the coordination is function. If you mass, mean mass, then mass space time. So that's the problem. The math of the theory was very complicated. Very, very complicated. It related the mass and the motion and the energy of the masses to the curvature of space time, to differential equations, to the non-linear, high, um, uh, high order. So it was a big mess. <laughs> but in 1916, just a year afterwards, he published another paper saying that one consequence of this theory was the production of gravitational waves. That if you solve this equation, like you solve massless equations in the absence of masses, then the solution in massless equations is an electromagnetic wave. In Einstein's uh, equations, you have to do a few more approximations, and then the approximate solution is also a wave, this time the wave of degree, the wave of space time, and those are the gravitational waves. But when you put numbers in there, the effect was really, really, really small because the effect has constants in there and it has Newton's constant of gravity and it has the speed of light. And the combination of constant has a small constant on the top, which is G and C to the fourth in the denominator. So in that paper, one in the last paragraph, it says these effects are negative, meaning they will never be discovered. He was looking for experimental predictions for the theory of gravity. So the idea is that if you have two stars, and nowadays we know that we can see stars not only from light, but from other kinds of waves, for example, full stars, we can see with um, the radio beams that they emit, we can see the full stars here on Earth, and we can tell the motion of those stars, those full stars. We can tell sometimes that those full stars are in balance. From the way you think that's at the sea. And Einstein's prediction is that those stars should be closing together, should be getting closer together because the gravitational fields are going to take energy away. That's a very different prediction than Newton's theory that says that these stars are going to orbit forever. And this was observed. This was observed in the 70s. So you have probably heard about gravitational waves. Recently, astronomers began hearing about gravitational waves in the seventies because when the first such binary system of neutral stars was discovered, it had an eight-hour period. I don't know that many of you here that, uh, that everybody here knows what a neutral star and pulsar is. A pulsar is a neutral star that pulses that produces these wave beams. A neutral star is a star that's left after the supernova explosion, uh, the sound supernova explosions, where about the mass of the star, a little more, more than the mass of the sun, gets concentrated in the size of a small city, smaller than Atlanta. Imagine the compactness of such sun, the mass of the sun compacted that much. A teaspoon. <laughs> Of the neutral star, a uh, good way we could have it here and have more millions of tons. It's huge. Those neutral stars, again, we know about them from these radio signals. And in the 70s, um, in 74, I think it was, the first binary system was discovered. Um, Joe Taylor is an astronomer that has always been studying neutral stars. Uh, was the first, was his graduate student at the time doing what I imagine, I never heard his study this, but I imagine taking very boring measurements because what he was doing is looking at these ticks, these radio ticks, radio signals that were very regular, and he was looking for some regularity in there that could be explained by that companion star. And he found one, they found one. So they published about this system, and the amazing thing about this first binary pulsar system is that the orbit was only eight hours period. That's very fast. Imagine two suns moving around each other, two sides, the size of Atlanta, smaller than Atlanta, moving around each other in eight hours. The air goes around the sun once a year. And 
less than 100 hours. So they are moving fast, they are emitting radiational waste, they are losing energy, and they are getting closer to that. And measuring the size of that orbit over the years, notice, notice that in this plot, and I forgot to ask, I don't have a pointer to you. For a while. Okay, now that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we tested this before and then we forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a quantity related to the size of the orbit. And these are years of those observations. These are way observations in the LSE observatory. Notice that they started in 75 or so. That's the first thought. The last one plotted here is 2005, but there's been even more measurements taken. And you can see the, the orbit shrinking exactly as ISS theory predicted. So they received the Nobel Prize in 1993 because of this discovery. So there was a Nobel, Nobel Prize, not only to Einstein and not for his theory of relativity, but also for the observation of gravitational waves. Now, why cannot we detect this? Well, like Einstein said, the gravitational waves themselves, this distortion, this wavy distortion of space time, is very, very, very small. These stars, the merger of these stars, these stars are far from having, they would have like 300 million years to measure, so we are not going to wait for the measure of this system. But, there are other systems, there are many galaxies, so we wanted to see neutron stars. So how strong is that and how often does it happen? That is a big question. Well, it doesn't happen very often. In our galaxy, it happens about once every 100,000 years. <laughs> That's getting too long to wait, so if you want to see one like this, you have to see them farther away. So if you were to think about the Vigo cluster and all the galaxies in the Vigo cluster, well, then it happens once every 50 years or so. That's not so bad. That's about the way of the supernova. That's <laughs> we are still waiting for the happy supernova. So how strong, like in that distance, how strong is the gravitational wave produced by the merger of neutron stars? The amplitude of gravitational waves is measured in something that other brothers in physics love, which is dimensionless units. <laughs> no dimensions. And that's because the amplitude of the wave is measured by the fractional change in distance. If you're measuring one meter, you're going to get half the change than if you measure the change in distance in two meters. The fractional change is a set. So the fractional change produced by binary neutron star merger in the Vigo cluster is how small? Smaller than 0.1, smaller than 0.35 million, it's 10 to the minus 21. That's very small, it's very difficult to imagine. So let's try it. <laughs> imagine the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's a long distance. It takes seven minutes for the light to travel. It's a long distance. How much would be the change in that distance due to gravitational wave of this magnitude? It would be of the order of atomic diameter. And of course, we cannot measure the distance between the Earth and the Sun to that position. So for many years, well, for many years, physicists thought that gravitational waves may not be quite brilliant, might be causing a happy stars. Then of course when became brilliant because experimental observations proved it. Then astronomers said, well, they are impossible to measure, physicists could have the challenge. Uh, they said, well, maybe they can be measured. There were other techniques uh, that split in two. A laser is a magnetic wave, a light wave is written to in the beam splitter, and then it travels some distance to get reflected on a mirror, and then the two waves come back, and if these two distances are the same, then the waves that come out of the electron cancel each other. 
But if there is a gravitational wave coming, then it will change that distance different than this distance. It will make one shorter than the other longer, which means that these waves are not going to cancel anymore. So if we put a photosetting here, and we just measure how much light there is in that photosetting, the gravitational wave could be measured if we see more light, less light, more light, less light. That's a measurement. What can be seen there, right? Interferometry is used to measure these different distances where they are precisely in many different applications. Myers and Ori used that in the 1980s, trying to find the ether and, and proving the end of the ether differences. So it is a well known technique. However, remember that we wanted to measure fractional changes of distance of 10 to the minus 21. And we certainly cannot make an interferometer as long as the distance between the air and the ground. If you want to do it on Earth, how big can it be? Maybe a few kilometers. So people in the 70s, especially very wise and then uh, Jim Thorne, looked at the size of interferometers that could be used on Earth. They decided that. A few kilometers would probably be enough. They calculated for the sensitivity. They said they might reach 10 to the minus 21, and probably better after installing better technologies. So they convinced me and Megan like, and Matty to propose this project, this scenario project in the late 80s, convinced you, convinced the National Science Foundation, to approve the construction, not of one, but of two. Live observatories. One in Livingston, Louisiana. These are four kilometers long. So this is the L shape, but this is Google Earth. You can make this movie. <laughs> and then 3,000 kilometers away, or 10 milliseconds away, probably this is the time, the one in Hanford, Washington. One in the middle of the forest, one in the middle of the desert, both at four kilometers long. These were the detectors that measured gravitational waves in 2015. But they told me they were approved in 1992. It took a long while to build and make this work and the sensitivity that allowed the question. But this was not just happening in any way, which I done <laughs> there. Um, so uh, in the end, uh, we allowed, we in the in the U.S., scientists in the U.S., scientists in Europe, in UK, and in Germany, and science in other countries in the world, including Australia, Nicholas in Australia, joined in the Bible scientific collaboration. Vigo, uh, the Vigo collaboration that started being French Italian, uh, they, now they have like eight or nine countries, um, they did a three kilometer detector in the region. So, this was a worldwide effort. Uh, there is now a detector about one million operational in the next year in Japan. There's an observatory being built in India. So, this, even from the beginning, was a worldwide effort. Now, I told you that these gravitational waves were expected to be very small. And now that we have measured in here, that was a contagious for what? They are very small. So, how precise do you have to make these detectors? Well, 10 to the minus 21 is that quotation. If you want to know the distance precision that you need to have in these interferometers, you multiply 4 kilometers times 10 to the minus 21. What do you get? 4 to the minus 18 meters. Let's see how well you remember your numbers. How big is an atom? How big is an atom? How big is a lot smaller than that? How big is a proton? And to the minus 15. And we are measuring, we have measured 4 10 to the minus 18 meters. Four parts in a thousand of the proton diameter in the differential distance between these four kilometers and these four kilometers. 
No wonder he didn't think this is going to work. <laughs> it, was, it was a, a controversial funding. But this is the bit of the dynamic today of how it works. What we predict what this noise is going to be in the detector, and then when we measure the noise in the detector, we don't say that the line is 15, that the line is 20. We have to know what we have to know what frequency we're talking about. So we decompose the noise, the strain noise, as a function of frequency. At some frequencies, we have a lot more noise than others. This black curtain here is the noise that we measured in our detectors in 2010. That was the end of what we call the initial LIGO era, when we had been these detectors in Hansel and Livingston and taking data for the past few years. And you can see that these numbers, 10 to the minus 21 is here, 10 to the minus 22, 23, so you might say, oh, it's done a lot better than it said you were going to do. It's not quite why, because this is the density. So, if you want to know the noise you have in the frequency band, this is our best frequency band, and you have to integrate the noise in here, and the integral of this noise goes up 10 to the minus 21. So, the noise was 10 to the minus 21. We needed to get to be better than that if we wanted the signal that, was, that the signal was 10 to the minus 21. So, this is what we call initial diagram, as I mentioned. Uh, and we knew what the noise was due to, more or less. We knew that this noise was due to the counting noise in the number of photos. When we put the photos there, in the end, what we are doing is counting photos. But photos are a quantum quantity, so the number of photos is uncertain. So if you have a quantum uncertainty, we call that the quantum noise. In electronics, it's called short noise, but quantum noise sounds better. <laughs> um, so this is the quantum noise that depends on the number of photos we're counting. The more photos, the better. At low frequencies, the noise rises very steeply because of seismic noise. Seismic noise is moving the mirrors, and that noise is competing with our uh, with the amplitude, the distance uh, change produced by gravitational waves. And uh, at the middle frequencies, the noise is dominated by what we call the thermal noise, the brownian motion of the atoms in the mirrors. And when you think about that, and you have to think more than a minute for this, the motion, that brownian motion, is a lot larger than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So, how is it that we can measure 10 to the minus 18 meters here? That's because we average our mirrors at very big and we average the position of many mirrors where the laser hits. The size of the noise is a lot smaller than the, the, the ground motion. The ground motion is about the micron at these frequencies, uh, minus 10 meters or so. Again, how do we get to these small numbers with a lot of size and estimation? Maybe by pendulums and masses and so forth. So, there's another curve in here. We understood this noise. We knew this was not enough. We did not get gravitational waves in 2010. So, we had technology that had been developed by the other scientific professionals and other people to do better. And we wanted to do, and we want to do this much better. So, with this um, initial noise, we don't see. Binary you start mergers to about a vehicle cluster, which is what we had in that. So we proved that we could be in this system, and that was a proof of principle. 15 to 20 megahertz. The best we got, the best distance we got is 20 megahertz. We wanted to get here. Here, if we get here, when we get here, we have a bridge of about 200 megahertz. 10 times better. Now, 10 times better means a lot, because it means that you can see 10 times farther, 200 megahertz, you can see a volume that's a thousand times larger. So that means that if you saw, if you saw zero signals in here, you would see zero times the past. <laughs> that's not quite true. <laughs> because we knew that from predictions, from these binary points of predictions, there was an estimate of how many 
many business class call yes, and they delivered and we thought that we needed at least 100 megapascals to see this. So how did we do that? Well, we used better cycling isolation. Here we used we used rounding noise, we used lower loss materials, we used more photons to reduce the quantum noise. <coughs> and just to show you what this now, and with this we will get 200 megapascals. At the time we made these slides, which was 95. For a year, that obviously that's circa 2019, probably going to be circa 2021. What do we get in that specific? How do we do that? Well, we do it not with simple microphone in the parameter, uh, with fixed mirrors on optical tapers. Our mirrors have big mirrors, 40 kilograms, maybe 25 centimeters in diameter, hanging in quadruple pendulums. That's part of the seismic isolation. All of that hanging from an active seismic isolation platform <coughs> that measures and cancels the noise in between the layers. All of that inside vacuum chambers. Those mirrors are state of the art masses in terms of coating and polishing. The lasers travel in vacuum for kilometers. These are vacuum ultra high vacuum tubes inside a concrete enclosure, which, <coughs> which protects the vacuum system from fires, brush fires that have been in Washington, hurricanes and in Louisiana, high winds in Washington. Cars crashing that happened in Hamburg. So we've had all of that. Bullets in Louisiana. <laughs> so again, the goal, the goal is to get this sensitivity. We are not there yet. We knew it was going to take years to get to that sensitivity because we knew how long it had taken us to get this sensitivity from the targets from the hardware. Now, how much we knew about what we wanted to detect? Well, it only about neutral stars, but actually what many people were also interested in were black holes. As it turns out that black holes are much simpler systems than neutral stars. Because to predict the gravitational wave, you can use some approximations when the black holes are far away, and when they get closer together, well, the approximations are not so good, so you have to use computers. But there's no, there are no atoms. So you don't have to do physics, you don't have to do chemistry, you just need to do general relativity. So that's one reason why physicists at least love black holes. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Go back to that earlier plot of the noise. <coughs> just out of curiosity, the lower noise spike from there, what's the big spike? This big spike? Yes. That's the resonance frequency of the vertical mode. So we are hanging the, <coughs> the mirrors are hanging like pendulums, and the, uh, the horizontal and low and pitch modes, those are all low frequencies, one has to go. But the vertical mode and the ball mode, the ones that stretch the fibers, those are higher frequencies. And those are the most yeah. You also uh, see in that in that plot that there are lots of lines in here. We have lots of lines in the spectrum. There are lines from 60 hertz power lines, from violin, the violin modes of our from our pendulums of the fibers, from vibration lines, <laughs> and many lines that we don't know where they come from. Okay. It wasn't that long ago that we used sort of isolated equations in the computer. It actually took a long time to make the computer, the codes behave. But we knew that this, this shows the, the gravitational field, the curvature of space time, near the black holes as they are getting closer together, and the expected gravitational wave far from the black holes. So it is a sine wave after the black holes down the angle. 
But as they get closer together, then they are moving faster, so the amplitude is larger, the frequency is higher. Here they're getting close to merger, and notice that this is getting crazy here. Mm -hmm. So we thought that this merger was going to be crazy too. But in fact, it's something very simple. There's the peak and then the head. If you look at all the talks, at all the slides from Kipthorn, um, advertising and pushing for the medical to the typical calculations of merger of black holes, then there are much we knew what it looked like because this is an approximation. This part, which we knew what it looked like because once that once the black holes merge, then it's just a black hole breaking down and there are other approximations, but there are crazy drawings for this merger. <laughs> That was simpler, nature ended up being simpler than we thought. Which is, was good for us because that meant that it was easier, it was going to be easier to do for this image in our data. For black holes, for neutral stars, we expect to see the signals long before they emerge in our sensitive frequency time. They measure the kilohertz, so we will see many, many cycles before that. For black holes, they get bigger, so they emerge at the lower frequency. So we will see only a few cycles. So having for the neutral stars, we don't have other different amplitudes with fraction of a second. Because we have all of these. But for black holes, this was important. And lastly, it was simpler. And now you can understand why we were so surprised and really shocked. When on September 14, 2015, we were testing our advanced medical detectors to begin taking data by the end of this week. This is a Monday, so we were planning to begin uh, an observation run that was going to last a few months. Um, we had a sensitivity, we never recorded that the best sensitivity we had with the initial level of smart devices. At this time, these detectors might go around 60 megawatts, far from the 200 megawatts we wanted, but much better than we had before. So we had planned this year before, once we get there, we can take up the demand. We won't, we won't see anything, but we will uh, test our codes, our instruments, and the temperature, and then keep working on the building. Um, that night, that early morning, this is what we saw. So this is the time series, remember the focus and the signal from the photo cell in blue in Livingston and in orange in Hanford, but shifted 70 seconds. And in blue, you can see that this is the normal rumbling that you see, this is the noise that you always see in the detectors. But then there's a sine wave that increases. In amplitude and frequency, now this period is shorter than this period. Just like the simulation has told us, and then it behaves. And then in the same signal with a huge amplitude, notice this is 10 to the minus 21 amplitude. Notice that the noise is a lot smaller as with frequent times this initial value. But these were focused signals in focused 3,000 kilometers away. And they were these cables when you shifted them by 70 seconds. So when we saw this, I have to say that none of us believed it. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, who put that in there? We opened one simulation, we actually pushed the viewers to simulate gravitational waves to test our systems. That's what we thought this was. <laughs> this is a dream. <laughs> But I was a spokesperson at the time. I knew I had not authorized anyone to do such a thing. I had been following all the tests. So I said, who forgot to put it in the log? <laughs> we looked in the channels, we asked everybody. It was not our doing. <laughs> it was weird. Well, we didn't know it was weird, actually. It took us. <laughs> I think it was immediate time. Well, we have the calls that were being tested at the time during the run, the running of the run, really, but the, the calls that were being tested that analyze the data as fast as they can, and that's within seconds. And then they post the results on one page, and that's within minutes. And then we in the run, that sends alerts to text messages and phone calls to notify people. You know, 
of my other questions how long who called who first? But we were not ready yet, so we did not have that analysis. We did not have all the things that have yet. That's why actually we have not started the research at the end. So that it was the first dog uh, in Germany. This happened at Bible and David Trump. So it's still a bit for anybody to be looking at the web pages. Uh, they all raised your kids and had the money and they didn't want to do it. But it was the post in Germany, but it was the afternoon, so they they actually noticed this French thing and the day that they called the observatories to say, is anything French happening? <laughs> Nothing strange was happening, so uh, other people began looking at the same design. This is a code that was not looking for these uh, models of climate systems, it was looking for excess power in the signals that correlated. And from that point on, of course, we can analyze it within, within a few hours, <coughs> hundreds of people on the phone. Yes. Uh, how many seconds was the one that was detected by? How many seconds was? The uh, one of the other detectors that was detected by. The difference in time, I like to recommend it's not going to be like you now. <laughs> <laughs> So when you did your simulation on when you moved the mirror, did you do that in a synchronized manner with seven milliseconds away between the two facilities? We have done it in the past. We haven't finished setting up the system to do these simulations with these detectors, but we have done it in the past, yes. Uh, these simulations to some origin and the distance in the sky and then produce the gravitational waves the way you think that they would have. We could down the way on the face uh, on the face picture. So it was February 11, 2016, seven months later, that we were ready to announce this to the board. That day is a very important day. After today, you will never be there. But if I were this in February, February 11, 2016, had been declared. Before, as the international 